small farm conference is one of those kinds of investments of time. You start to learn things. I was just at a great little session, and it was for new farmers, but believe me, I learned a lot. Uh, we had an outbreak session, and, and Steve Schwartz, you were down there, and your great program was part of that. But we learned a lot about what it's like to be in uh, agriculture today, what it's like to start up as a brand new grower. It is not easy, and yet at the same time, you'll find folks that will tell you it's been a breeze. Well, how can there be such differences of opinion? Well, part of it is your potentiality. Uh, choosing what you produce, how you produce it. Um, I, I go back to, in my farming days, I remember when they told us for, uh, for really decades and decades that you can't grow artichokes any place but Castroville. Remember that? That was an old myth. And they told you you can't grow blueberries. Remember that? And they told you you can't have flour local milled flour uh, as a part of your own uh, local regional food shed. Remember that? And they told you that you can't really have cattle unless it's a bigger operation. Remember that? These are all these myths, if you will, of different kinds of way of looking at what your food limitations are, your food system limitations are. And I got to tell you, there are no limitations. Um, so much of what we're uh, doing right now in agriculture, it, it is going to be big, but believe me, it's going to be small, it's going to be intermediate, it's going to be all kinds of different things. I I'll often say that my company, we were in the celery business for some 40-something years, and we quit. We quit about eight years ago because we finally, and we should have quit earlier, but we finally recognized that we were great celery growers, but our costs of land, costs of water were too high, and I couldn't be, compete with Baja, couldn't compete with Ventura, and we stopped. And we shut down our celery operation. We walked away from a whole marketplace because I didn't want to move. Well, this last year, we finally changed our mentality and we came back and we grew celery, but what did we do? We grew it the same way we did before. We changed our marketplace. And we, had a, we have had a good year this year with that. But changing your scale of marketing then is a lot of what this is all about. Knowing when to quit and then knowing when you want to start up again. All of these things come into play if you've been in business for a while. Um, we recognize that as you start to look at the new tools, whether it's mobile processing units for livestock, uh, and that's both for poultry and for cattle, when you, or, or goats as well. When you look at your regional uh, milling and processing capacity to take at a small scale an instant quick freeze or, a, or any kind of other processing to create a local driven marketplace, these new tools are scalable. They don't have to be the, a building the size of this, this hotel. They can be very small, they can be very efficiently run with new green technologies, and we know that if you don't fit in your box, I think it was mentioned in the keynote session today, someone said, I, I, you know, it's hard to fit in the box, this, 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 this paradigm of agriculture production. Well, if you don't like the box that you're in, then you can change your box. In fact, you need to uh, really reassess what you're doing if it's not working. And part of that is then knowing who your consumer is. The California consumer is, is a very complex kind of individual, don't you all think so? Um, they're very spoiled, they're very uh, smart, they're very uh, sharp, and they're very demanding. Um, and you have to understand where is your consumer that was mentioned in our, our, our breakout session, but it was also mentioned earlier here if you're out in the middle of nowhere. It's hard to understand what is your cu customer all about. Uh, what does your customer want? What is, uh, how much can your customer willingly pay, especially in a down economy? Um, how much more will your con customer buy? Here's, here's a good example. You know, I, I've been in this position now for going into my seventh year, and this will be our last year as, as our administration winds up. Uh, but I moved up to Sacramento, and I, I come from a farming environment, but since I moved to Sacramento, my consumption of peaches has gone up tenfold, a thousand percent. Not, not a hundred percent, which is double. It's gone up tenfold. My consumption of almonds has gone up in my personal diet a, th a thousand percent, tenfold. My uh, consumption of prunes has gone up. It's maybe because I'm older, I don't know, but um, they do produce some great prunes up there, or dried plums, as they, uh, uh, as they say. But um, the, point is, the point is that it's interesting. Your buyers, the buyers that we have, this 20 million people down here in Southern California, the millions that are up in the Bay Area, their capacity to increase their consumption, not by 10, 20, 30, 40 percent, by, by enormous volumes, is an enormous opportunity, is it has enormous potentiality. Uh, I eat more avocados than I've ever eaten. Because why? Because good avocados you can find year round. Um, many of you, anybody here remember the old Irvine Ranch Market off of the I-5 freeway? There's a few hands go up. 
That was the original Whole Foods concept before it was way ahead of his time. They were the, one of the first local farmers, markets kind of concepts. It was right along the freeway. Bus loads of people would come on their way up to Disneyland, and somehow they would miraculously stop at this guy's roadside stand, and he built it into a really amazing thing, but he delivered really the best quality that you could possibly find anywhere during a time when there really was a lot of product here in Southern California. This is 40 years ago when he started, 40, 50 years ago. And remember the produce.com that kind of came and went? Uh, it was this kind of a, a virtual grocery store. Um, it's interesting, that, that has come back a lot. In fact, I had a chance to visit a grower the other day who started, he was a grain grower. He was a grain grower and he came to the, uh, California, saw the CSA model, was thrilled by the chance to say, wow, look, they're growing stuff that I haven't seen in a long time in the area where I'm from. I'm going to start my own CSA. So he carved out five acres of his, his ranch and got a bunch of friends to subsidize the growing of basically a, a, a fledgling CSA. Well, that CSA today has 50,000 customers and it's a $50 million business and it's in Europe. It's in Copenhagen, it's outside of Copenhagen, it's called Arstedern. And it's, a, it's an amazing, ten, in a 10, 11 year, 12 year period, this fellow who was a grain grower basically found new customers, found new products he wanted to grow, delivered them what they wanted. In fact, when they don't have citrus, because people ask him, how come you can't give me citrus? And he has to, he has to tell them, we don't grow citrus in Denmark. <laughs> Believe me, people don't understand why, but you have to even tell them. He finds like-minded growers, he's an organic biodynamic grower, but he finds like-minded growers down in Seville. And you go online on his website on the day of harvest in that block of oranges, there's the grower on the website telling the buyers that he's harvesting this block of oranges for their box tomorrow. And the whole concept here is that he's found a new alignment, if you will, of how he wanted to be in business. Uh, I'm lucky because in this business, as you know, I, I, we're talking about our ag vision. We're, you should know, and if you don't know, you need to know. We've been trying very hard, working with the American Farmland Trust, with Roots of Change, with uh, Farm Bureau, with Western Growers, with all the different groups to try and create a vision for California agriculture. And California agriculture in the year 2030, what is it going to look like? What can it, what can it be? And what's interesting, it's exciting what it might be. And I think one of the things we see coming out of this is the convergence of what you would understand to be a watershed, a food shed, and an energy shed. Why, as you converge those, those, those resources and those concepts together, you start to see there's a synergy. There's a ability to take new technologies that are maturing today, old concepts that have always been around, and you get things like growing energy beets in the San Joaquin Valley to drive an uh, energy system that will desalinate water on the west side that will also take the desalinated water, mine the brine line, turn it into uh, uh, the salts into baking soda and sell it as a product so the fresh water is a byproduct. You'll start to see uh, projects where you take the dairy digesters and they're taking the digester, taking the methane creating energy to drive the pumping system over at the uh, Merced Irrigation District. They're not even going into the grid, not even going to Southern Cal Edison or going into PG&E. They're going directly into an adjacent partnership with a water district pumping need. And they're taking then in the, in the, in the conversion of energy, they have CO2 coming off of, the, uh, off of the generator. They're capturing CO2 and growing algae for an energy and a feed product for the cows going back into the dairy. And you start to see that there's uh, this idea that uh, I keep on saying it and I will continue to say it. We used to be in the cotton business quite a bit in this country, in this state, uh, and we shipped the textile industry overseas for cheap labor. Well, today a lot of the things like the, the, the nap napkins in your lap or the tablecloth, people don't have to sit there and sew on a sewing machine. It's all digitalized. So if we have cheap energy and we can digitalize the whole process of, of cotton fiber use or hemp use, that, you know, hemp the fiber use, um, I have to clarify those things, um, is that we, why wouldn't we be in our own textile industry again in our different regions because it's scalable, it's, it's small. So thinking scalable projects is kind of what this is all about as we start to look at, at the future here.